It is end of October 2015 on Vancouver Island in Canada. The rainy season is starting. The Soup River rushes through its borders. Even the Mamia Creek carries plenty of water. This puts an end to our Soup River fishing season. Time to reminisce on what we experienced here this year in Souk. Let me share a few thoughts that come to mind. From late September on, the fish arrive. Sometimes they jump like popcorn, as the expression goes. They make seals and sea lions come up into the harbor and basin and way up into the river. This year, some anglers even observed two orcas in the harbor and the basin. We all join in the excitement generated by the salmon run. Around the estuary of the Soup River, some fish may be kept. Hence, many anglers try their luck. Unfortunately, some try deliberately snagging the fish. This is illegal, and so is the use of barbed treble hooks. But some fish are caught legally with lures or even with flies and single barbless hooks. I have witnessed a lucky fly fisher catch several chum with a fly and a lovely coho on a spinner. However, such success is rare. For several days I tried his pattern, never hooking, let alone catching a fish. A bit further upriver the situation is very different. This is fly fishing only country. Fish congregate in holding pools, often by the hundreds. And the angling success skyrockets. No wonder that dozens of anglers line up along the pools and often three or four of them are simultaneously into fish. All fish caught here are released. Nonetheless, angling can be challenging. I met a totally dejected angler who in the course of six days invested in a fishing vacation on Vancouver Island trying everything between Campbell River and Souk, had never caught a single fish. Maybe different areas require different approaches. In my 10 years on the Souk, I have adopted an approach which rarely misses. In fact, the success can be almost obscene. I had experiences where I hooked into three fish in succession on a single cast, and until I decided to moderate myself two seasons ago, I had days where I hooked into 30 fish. The equipment and approach are quite simple. A number six or heavier rod with floating line, a two or three foot sinking tip, and a four to six foot leader of 12 to 20 pound test strength will do it. Although large flies in almost any color work, the most successful fly seems to remain what we call Ira's fly. Ira Pratt had patiently developed this fly over many years. It is an almost inconspicuous contraption tied on a small hook such as a number eight, a bit of braided silver tinsel for a body, a tiny spot of red wool for a throat, and four strands of flashable, silver, olive, or pearl. That's it. One morning this season I hooked a fish on my first cast with this fly. This fish took me three times way into my backing on runs some 100 to 150 meters down river. Each time I had to reel frantically when the fish decided to return upriver only to deliver another screaming run downriver. Similar antics by hooked fish can make anglers dance like these two. Those experiences are precious, and I would not want to miss them. However, remorse struck me. 
So, I'm able to harass some 30 to 40 fish in one morning while they are on their way to fulfill their life's mission. If we multiply this score, which is easily achievable with the outlined approach, by the number of anglers on the river, let's call it a conservative 20 to 40, then somewhere between 600 and 1600 salmon are harassed on their way to their spawning grounds in a single day. Why do we have to do that? Well, let's start with casting. It can be a lot of fun in itself and casting practice is always good. Beyond that, hooking a fish and bringing it to hand is quite exciting, particularly if you happen upon a strong, challenging fish. Chum salmon often do not really strike and it may take them a bit before they realize they are hooked. But angler beware once they realize that and they realize that they need to work to get free. Then, after releasing the fish, there's always hope for more. The hope to catch an even more challenging fish. The hope to hook into a coho or a spring salmon. It may be possible, however, that we could enjoy all this to the hilt while reducing the harm to our fish. I have to think of my many European friends who would happily spend thousands of dollars to experience what we have at our doorstep. The privilege of catching a few strong salmon during a fishing vacation. Maybe we could similarly be content with less. Maybe we could limit ourselves to no more than 10 hookups and three fish brought to hand per day. Maybe we could agree to only take pictures of salmon not lifted out of the water. Maybe we could agree to never dragging salmon onto the rocks, but to release them without taking them out of the water. Maybe we could develop enjoying the reward of releasing healthy fish fish that are able to contribute to the perpetuation of the species. Maybe the experience would then be even more rewarding because it would relieve us of the pangs of conscience which are inevitable if we drag salmon after salmon out of its way to complete its mission even though we do not need it as food. Watching the salmon in their struggle up the riffles, watching the pairs align, watching males compete for the favors of the ladies, being allowed to watch the cycle of life complete itself are immense privileges.
Beyond that, there's always abundant wildlife. Myriads of gulls, geese, eagles, seals, fish otters, and sometimes even bears. All this is reason to come back to the river and to enjoy the privilege of fishing here. And all this is also reason to feel obliged to contribute to the safety of the river and its many inhabitants.